Hello everybody and welcome back to the Fortress of Solitude. Today we're going to be talking about Absolute Superman issue 1 by Jason Aaron, Rafa Sandoval and Ulysses Arolia. This is the one I've been waiting for. How does Darkseid's influence on an Earth affect the Man of Steel, the paragon of hope and light? Jason Aaron has the beginnings of some of these answers here in this first issue as he explores his universe's Krypton, heading to the alien world and boy do I like the drastic changes he's done on Krypton in these first couple of pages. Krypton is still a technological marvel and the Kryptonians are still an advanced civilization but I love how instead of crystal tech and you know the stark white and bright rooms and everything, Aaron goes the other way and has Kryptonians using the planet's lava flows as power and most of the planet's resources as their power, almost kind of making it look very similar to what we see on stuff like Apocalypse. And again, this is probably that dark side influence on this culture. Of course, using the planet's resources, lava flows and all that sort of stuff is probably not the good thing to do and it will probably end up coming back to bite them in the ass. Another really cool thing he explores is a class system is also in full effect, with the Science League kind of ruling over everything and not stopping at anything in the name of science. They'll just do whatever they want in the search for more science and technology. Interestingly though, Jorel and Lara are not among their ranks. Instead, they are very different. They are like lower class people, living out in the dusty flatlands and relying on older tech, their know-how and grit to get by. Aaron chooses first to focus on Lara, who is a skilled mechanic and helps out the locals with their rusted old machinery as they are left at the mercy of the Sky Department and the Science League, who charge them for water for their crops and will withhold it if they choose to see fit. Lara's little backstory is really quite cool. She wanted to be an astronaut, she wanted to be a scientist, but criticised Krypton's lack of funding for space exploration and because of it she was cast out from society and forced to take work where she could. Aaron does some really interesting things with the House of L symbol here as we know it. There is still a House of L but it's no longer like just a family crest. Instead it's the symbol of the laborers, the people of steel as he calls them and much like Lara, Jor-El wears the symbol as he leads a group of people deep into a dangerous mine as their engineer, checking for fractures and stresses in the sunstones. Jor-El is quick to work out that the mine is going to collapse but the League of Middle Management, which is just a great name for a little you know part of the society i like that it's broken up into like things like that the sky department the league of middle management the science league just all sorts of things you'd see in like a very like tyrannical society that's very you know by the book and very structured this league of middle management want the mine back up and running at any cost and aaron weaves in the more classical traits of jor in this new take here citing how much of like how lara was exiled so was jor as he condemned the Science League's environmental recklessness, things we've seen in other iterations as he's often cited how Kryptonians are using all of the planet's resources and thus weakening the planet and that's exactly what is happening here. As the book puts it, the planet is rotting from the inside out and we get to see what happens firsthand when that happens as the mine does collapse and spews forth this green radioactive liquid that melts anything that it touches. With this liquid obviously being kryptonite or like a version of kryptonite that I'm sure we'll get to see a bit more of in later issues but I think it's really cool that kryptonite is like the, the hubris of of krypton it's not just radioactive pieces of the homeworld when it exploded it's it kind of already existed and it was just like a byproduct of krypton's hubris and just mining and just feeding off of their planet after that law field opening, Aaron thrusts us into present day on Earth, Brazil to be specific, where something not so different is happening in a mine, as a group of migrant workers are put in peril when their employers, the Lazarus Corporation, which seems to kind of rule over everything or own everything on Earth, tell them to dig through a deposit of asbestos to get to the diamonds below it. So far, the book has actually been narrated by Kal-El himself, and here is no different as he is well aware of what's going on on this mine, and he's encountered things like this before all across the world, and how Lazarus are abusing these people and keeping them and their families basically hostage until the work is done. But by then it will be too late and they'll all be dead thanks to asbestos poisoning or various other perils that come with mining in third world countries. 
Luckily, someone has dug up all of the diamonds already for the migrants and the asbestos is all but evaporated, meaning they can just turn in the diamonds and get paid and leave. The leader of the diggers, Joao, doesn't want to question what is happening and instead just wants to be paid and Lazarus is well aware of something going on and they want to get to the bottom of this because they know someone is doing this and they want to know who. Aaron peppers in a small world building lore here, citing the Omega Men and how they are kind of like this urban legend in this world and how maybe they're the good guys in this world, maybe they're like gods that these people believe in because that's kind of how it's framed where like these people think that the gods are there to help them and they view this person, the, the Superman, uh, is, a, is a god who is there to help them. The peacemakers are also standard troops for Lazarus, which is really quite fun. You know, they're covering the mine and keeping everyone in check, and it's kind of a neat use of the character of Peacemaker because he's very, you know, he's no questions asked, he follows orders, he's patriotic, so he's like kind of like the perfect person to kind of duplicate and make sort of like the stormtrooper of this universe. Joel Mimo, as it turns out, knows who is behind this, meeting with a hooded Kalel the night before, figuring out that he is the wild boy of the Amazon who speaks a strange language that he often hears the old timers of the camp talk about constantly. Superman doesn't say much but I like that he's trying to figure out what the truth of this world is. He's still willing to help out and find it that way and I really like that even on this world Superman is still Superman at his core. He wants to help out those he sees are being bullied and being mistreated. In the present, the peacemakers attack Joao knowing that he knows who is behind all of this and he's going to tell them who is. The big changes of Kal-El begin to show themselves as Kal-El has got this almost biomechanical suit called Soul, which uses a solar panel to help charge the hero put him in stasis to rest and various other things it basically protects him that's so damn interesting and cool hinting that maybe he doesn't have powers like we usually see with a traditional superman like he doesn't have like uh the cells in his body that you know harvest solar radiation like a kryptonian would under a yellow sun so he's got to use this sort of solar panel that comes out of the suit it's really interesting and i'm looking forward to seeing how aaron you know goes about showing the different aspects of the suit and how it it goes about working because right now we don't really know a lot about it we know it's kind of got an onboard ai that kind of acts as his jarvis who kind of like tells him about certain things and you know reminds him that he's meant to be protected and everything so this is something we've never really seen with superman before so that's really quite interesting i'd also like to point out rafa sandoval did a great job designing this costume i love how different it looks yet it still adheres to you know core concepts of superman suit he's got the symbol he's got these really cool cool like uh like braces and boots that are made of like this red material that look really cool that sort of glow when he gets mad and, and kind of powers up uh and the suit itself is kind of like the black suit it's, it's like a black very dark blue i i quite enjoy that and i like that there's no cape straight away either we do know he gets a cape that's apparently made of the dust of krypton the dead of krypton more or less uh which is really quite interesting um but i kind of like it without the cape it looks really quite cool. We also learn that as Cal charges, he begins dreaming of the work he's been doing on Earth, his never-ending battle, as you will, as there's no small amount of misery on this Earth, and Lazarus is at the center of it all, and he wants to stop it any way he can and he does so by going from these little camps and just like disrupting their businesses and you know doing all sorts he can just to try and stop Lazarus. As the peacemakers begin their search for Kal-El he springs into action blowing up one of their tanks and vehicles since as he puts it he's tired of running from these people and Superman fully reveals himself to them. We get a little bit more on Soul you know he's on board AI it's like the Jarvis who fills him in on the Lazarus Corp and how their technology is is not native to earth and we get to see that here and there throughout this part of the book where their guns they can just like auto print ammunition and kind of like adapt to the target they're firing on like the target they're firing on a superman so they adapt to like the highest caliber they can go to just try and punch through his armor and his skin but it doesn't still work and i quite like that idea that there's this ever evolving enemy superman has to fight and that he himself has to also evolve his techniques 
The suit also warns him about like hitting people and like maybe he might hurt them, maybe he won't, but Superman doesn't really care. He just wants to help the people. And if hurting the Lazarus people makes that happen, then he'll just do that. And he does that. He ends up beating up a bunch of the Lazarus corpse peacemakers before trying to save some of the people despite running low on solar energy. However, he's intercepted by a Spec Ops Lazarus team and their drones who electrify him. So this is when we're introduced to this Lazarus team and how they are pouring over information on Superman on how to defeat him. And one of their agents figures it out that it's his suit. And this agent is Lois Lane. So this is probably the biggest change for Absolute Superman so far. Everything else has been kind of sort of building off things we've seen before in Superman and, you know, classic character traits and stuff we've seen in lore before. But this kind of goes the complete opposite of what we know of Lois Lane. She's now a Lazarus agent. She's a soldier, more or less, as something she never really wanted to be, something her father wanted her to be, but she didn't. And I like that her commanding officer is probably going to be Sam Lane, her father. It's not said out loud but kind of gives off that feeling that this guy is Sam Lane it would make sense you know he's this general leading his troops into battle so I could see him being a big part of this storyline in the first part and he's been part of Superman's origins before where he's turned up and you know uh, Metallo's been on his side or something like that Angered at the attack, Superman unleashes his heat vision, a power he cannot control, and that soul reminds him he can't. Not only does his heat vision activate, but like all his heat powers and eye powers activate at once as we see him blast a guy with a heat vision and then with the x-ray vision so it's like all kind of coming out at once he can't control one that comes out after the other or you know one out of one eye one out of the other he can't do any of that yet he still very much doesn't know how his powers work and the suit even implores him to escape and leave the people behind since it's its duty to protect the last son of the house of El and he must remember the lessons of Krypton since the world can not be saved from themselves, something that Krypton did not adhere to. Before Superman can leave though, Lois manages to slap a power dampening cuff onto his hand and take him into custody, dubbing the man the Superman. Now I really like that despite Lois being so drastically different than what we're used to, she is still the one to name him Superman in this universe and that's kind of like a constant in all of these universes that she gets to be the one who gives him the name Superman. So while that's all the main story and that kind of ends out our main storyline here, Jason Aaron treats us to a few more teaser pages of what he's got cooking up for this absolute Superman, like the absolute Brainiac who's working away for Lazarus Corporation in Area 51, taking an interest in Superman. And we don't get to see what he exactly looks like, but he is still bottling cities or some sort of civilizations that want to be killed. And that, which is really interesting, they're, they're still, you know, they're not in stasis or anything. They, they're, they're actively living, which is quite interesting. The Kent farm also gets seen very briefly. We find that it's in disrepair, it's uninhabited, and is owned by the Lazarus Corporation. So what happened to the Kents in this universe? Did they even find baby Kal-El? Like, did he crash in Kansas? What exactly happened to them? I want to know. I hope they're not dead. I really hope that they are not dead. The final little teaser is we are taken back to Krypton, where it's revealed that Kal-El was not rocketed away from the dying world as a baby. He actually lived on Krypton to be a small child, along with his dog, who I assume is going to be Krypto. Jor, having survived his trip down the mine, knows the planet doesn't have long and it's already showing signs of dying up on the surface as kryptonite begins to seep out from underground. So it's only a matter of time before something happens to the planet and he wants him and his family to be ready. Absolute Superman, much like the Absolute Wonder Woman and Batman books before it, changed a familiar character in an engaging and creative way, still adhering to some of the core characteristics of these characters, but Aaron and his team explore them in some really awesome ways. I love all of the Krypton stuff we are getting this time around, just digging into this Krypton lore and exploring this new version of Krypton, which is a lot darker than what we usually see. I love the idea of this class system and what the House of L symbol has become and how Superman seems to be actively working to make it a very, you know, champion of the oppressed symbol, much like how he was when he first began back in 1938. So I like that Aaron is bringing it back around to the character's core roots. 
We even get some really cool new stuff like Superman with this cool biomechanical suit that has like a Iron Man AI in it sort of thing. We only get a little bit of it in this issue, but it, it seems like it's like such a cool concept that will have a lot of applications in coming issues. Aaron draws us in with so many cool moments like this and the Krypton stuff and I can't wait to see what he has in store for us later this month in issue 2. I am going to give this issue a 10 out of 10. Check it out if you haven't already.